Welcome to Business Pulse Talk Radio. I'm your host, Michael Brett. And Business Pulse is the heartbeat of business. We're here to help you understand operating a business, starting a business, how to raise capital, how to deal with investment bankers, how to deal with valuations for your business, and why are valuations important? Um, how to, again, how to start a business, how to deal with investors. Uh, business Pulse is all about business all the time. Today we have an exciting show. We have a friend of mine, uh, Rick Darnell, uh, with us today. He's going to be talking about a wide variety of different uh, business interests that he's involved with. But for all you basketball fans out there, I'm sure you know who Rick Darnell is. And for all you people listening to the show who are not basketball fans, we're going to do a little introduction with Rick. Rick, thank you for uh, being here today. No, thank you for having me here. You're welcome. Uh, let's start out again with your uh, professional basketball career. What were your uh, active years and what teams did you play for at the time? Well, I started off at Cypress College and then I went on to uh, Indiana State. Uh, from that point on, I, I entered into playing for the Virginia Squires. Uh, Dr. J was there and played in the ABA for a year. And then the merging of the leagues kind of uh, made it difficult for players because, you know, there's. You know, probably a couple hundred players who lost jobs that year when the ABA and the NBA merged. And so I bounced from Denver Nuggets to the Phoenix Suns and then was offered a very large contract to go over and play in Italy. And so I went to play in Italy for one year thinking I was going to come back and play for the Milwaukee Bucks. Well, I was MVP of, over there for like three straight years and uh, ended up playing probably 10, 11 years over there. Loved it. Uh, came back to the Clippers my one of my last years and then broke my ankle and tore my Achilles. Oh. And at that point, uh, got in, into a beer company with uh, Fred Belitnikoff and Jack Youngblood and Jim Youngblood and got off, got into the business world. Oh, excellent. Is the game a lot different today than it was when uh, when you were playing? <laughs> Extremely. It's, <laughs> it was so physical back in the days. Um, I, I don't think some of the younger players that are playing in the league this year would be able to get up and down the court. Uh, the hand checking, the physical. This, uh, if you went in for a layup, uh, you got got by a guy. You might get that layup the next time you'd be on the on the <laughs> on the floor picking splinters out of your butt. But <laughs> it's 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 gotten a. L Lot less physical, more transition game now. So. Probably a lot of broken noses back in those days too, huh? Awful lot. Of Under the those, hoop, uh, he got those weekly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I understand now. Now that you're out of uh, professional basketball as a player, that you're involved with the uh, retired NFL Players Association. Tell us a little bit about that role. Well, I'm now the uh, the pl uh, president of the NBA Retired Players and uh, LA chapter, and so what we do is we. Uh, put on probably eight to ten maybe fifteen events a year going out and, and working with the inner city kids kids at risk uh, doing basketball camps mentoring to them and uh, show them there's another way out um, just basically help them through life and uh, we're doing a lot with the Indian tribes we do a lot with Sherman Indian High School uh, I met with Pachanga Paula uh, Saboba all the local uh, tribes here too and we're trying to do some great things. AC Green and I are very close on working on the project at uh, Sherman Indian High School, where it's it's a high school where there's 500 kids that um, are brought in from across the country, and uh, us at Commissario and with AC Green and, and the retired players have been going out and making sure they're giving things. To, uh, from food to clothing and things to help them get through life. Now, did your playing years or being involved with professional sports prepare you for going into business. I know you're, we're going to go mm. into that in a, in a few minutes. I know you're involved in several businesses, cannabis being one, uh, tequila, which is with Elite Beverage. Uh, they've been on the show several times. I know you've got a lot of business interests, but let's, again, talk about the basketball. Did that kind of prepare you, give you some insights on how to conduct business? You know, it's, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, the biggest fear of being an athlete is what, what's, what's going to happen to you when you retire. And the, my, my fear was like, okay, I, I minored in business, and when I, when I get out of playing pro sports, how am I going to get a job? How am I going to enter into the, the corporate world? Because all my friends who I went to college with are now executives like that. They've been 
15, 15 years and they're really established in, in the industry. And now I'm, I'm from playing basketball and now I'm trying to jump into that arena. And you're calling friends up and saying, hey, can you help me? I, I want to get a job. I'm going to be retiring soon. And they go, yeah, well, you're going to have to start off in the mail room or whatever. And I'm going, <laughs> how can I go be in the mail room with the guys who used to be my fans? Yeah. You know, it, it, was, it, it was very hard to transition. Now we have groups of people that are helping uh, players transition into the um, in business sector, but it's it's tough. But you always you're always afraid, and the only reason I got into the beer business it was I still had a few more years I could have played. But Fred Bolitnikov from the Oakland Raiders and uh, Jack Youngblood came to me and says we're starting this beer company. Would you like to get involved and be one of our partners? And I go. There, I finally got my opportunity. Now I know where I can jump out of uh, pro sports and have a job and, and do something in life. So it's all about networking, too. I mean, I, tell, all, I talk about that on the show. Even if you're not in pro sports, you know, it's in, if you're in business, it's about ne- networking, getting out there, shaking mm-hmm. hands, going mm-hmm. to meetings, and, you know, just making introductions yourself and being introduced by other people. Mm-hmm. Same thing, it sounds like, in your case. Oh, definitely. And what I do is, as the president of, of the Repi- Retired Players LA chapter out here right now, is I, I put on probably six to eight events in, during the year, and it's always networking with businessmen because a lot of the guys were never taught um, how to network and really help to su- help yourself succeed. And I've kind of I'm grooming the light. I'm, I, I think feeling myself as one of the master networkers. <laughs> I've got a Rolodex that won't quit, and I learned that from one of my high school. Uh, I met my junior college coach Tom Lubin. He always said that. Um, when you when you're playing or after the game, you go out and meet these people. These are corporate American, I'm corporate America, and they're the guys who pay the tickets, who have the big corporations. And he says, so don't forget that you know that card. And he goes, after you got that card, right on the back, who he was. It was, was he the buyer? Of, was he the president of uh, Albertsons, or was he the president of? of whatever the company that came along and then send them a note afterwards and start building that Rolodex because they were your fan on the court. And so when it comes to time that you need to bring a product or your company come into that industry, the they it's the easiest way is to go talk to somebody who was a fan of yours who knew knows who you are and you can build that bond at first and get that, you know, uh, comfort level when you first start talking and they'll open up a lot of doors for you. I don't know if it's the same with bas- professional basketball, but I've, I've heard a lot of uh, in the news has been lately about prof- professional football players who retire. I, I guess the numbers are staggering, like maybe 60 or 70 percent of them are bankrupt of within five years after retiring from the sport, mm-hmm. uh, you know, um, because they really didn't have or they didn't take it seriously, I guess, when they were playing. They were making a lot of money, and they kind of thought their gravy train was going to continue on forever. So they really didn't have a mentor, if that's a, if that's a word, or somebody kind of putting a structure together for them. Mm-hmm. That's professional football. Was it the same thing in professional basketball? Do a lot of them just blow everything when they retire? Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's pretty much the same. It's more like 70 80% of the guys are bankrupt in the first three years. Um, there's a couple of bank, large organizations have had, done, um, uh, have, have investigated and found out that that number is high, if not higher. And the biggest problem is, is you, in the old days, you have agents who handled everything aspect of it. Now, the the the, the world has changed where you have an agent, you have an attorney, you have an investment banker, you have a marketing group. Before it was all under one roof, and your agent took a piece of everything and uh, put a lot of guys in bad spots. And um, I have a couple incidents where I have some really high, uh, highly thought of uh, players that I had to, in the last four or five years, had to talk to them. And I'm saying their they're, um, they're financial advisor is coming to me and saying that they're broke. And I go, what do you mean you're broke? And he goes, he is broke. And, I, and and he goes, you need to help me to talk to him to help. He's spending way too much money. And I go, what's going on? Well, he's got 10 guys who are the, his little entourage, which is the big thing now in pro sports. You have all these guys who went to high school with you and did all these wonderful things, bought you hamburgers and Cokes and took you to practice. And now in return, they're expecting brand new cars and new houses and all this stuff because they help you get there. 
and I'm trying to educate the guys that, you know, there are, you, there's a few of their friends, and they did this for a reason. Some of them really cared about you, but sometimes just like wanted to be around you, but they really abused some of the players. And most of, uh, one of the players was, uh, uh, he had probably about thirty to forty thousand dollars a month. Was just going to his entourage, who was spending his money on the his, using his cars as food. And but they would go out. They would buy the whole uh, club Cristal or one of the big oh, brands geez. cigar, uh, and and <clears throat> just put him broke. And I actually asked him to do me a favor, and he, um, I told him to tell them they're all you're, they're broke and they're all living with your house back east and, and uh, tell them they can't use the, they use the car, they use their own gas, they won't use the cars, that they pay their insurance and tell them for 30 days and I go after that 30 days to find out what happens then. And uh, the first night a couple of guys got in fights because of uh, that situation because he <laughs> didn't pay the bill and by, I mean, at the end of it, uh, one, he had two kids left uh, in his house, and it was it was a fight almost every night because he wouldn't cough up that money. And uh, last night he called me up. He goes, "I got it. I got a trouble. One guy is leaving. He ain't gonna put up no more. He keeps trying to borrow money, and you know he's he's very upset with me." And the other guy asked me for my uh, bank account number. Oh, and I go, "What did he want your bank account number?" Because because he had inherited some money and he wanted to give it to me. I go, "There's your real friend." Yeah. <laughs> so it's hard to find out your real friends when you get to this level. So, so. they all start jumping ship, and uh, when the money starts drying up, or you turn the tap off, it, it, they yeah they jump ship. Let's let's get into your business uh, businesses now, and um, I understand that, uh, and or I know firsthand that you're involved with Elite Beverage, uh, which is based in Anaheim Hills, and their uh, flagship product is uh, Tequila Commissario. You're a founding partner of that organization. Mm -hmm. Just give us uh, some insight on how you got involved with the tequila business and with uh, tequila commissario specifically. All right. Well, it kind of goes back to like when I saw I got involved with Fred Bullitt and the Cuff and that beer company. We, I learned that in an early age with them is packaging is so important on selling a, pro a product to get out on the shelf. And uh, we were at the, uh, I think, 2011 or 2012 uh, NBA All-Star Game. Me and Julie Servin, Dr. J, it was hosting an um, uh, after-party of the All-Star Game. And I had a lot of different sponsors with a lot of different products, alcohol, cognac, everything you can imagine uh, uh, was in that room. And I was walking around, and a very close friend and my, my founding partner, Steve Rice, was there. And uh, everybody kept raving about this tequila. And they go, Rick, you got to try this. Uh, Tori Coffer, her father, played for the Dodgers and says, Rick, this is fabulous. And so I go to get over to it, and uh, they, uh, I'm looking at it, I go, wow, what a beautiful packaging. And I go, I go, I got to try this. And I'm not, you know, the, the, I'm used to the old days of, you know, the, the not so good tequilas. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say any names. There's still a lot out there, but yeah. And so I went over it and I tasted the Yeneo, <clears throat> the Blanco, the Rapo, and then the Yeneo, and it was really beautiful. And it was almost like a cognac. It had such a creamy, beautiful taste. It wasn't. It was a sipping tequila. And I go, this is one of the best tequilas I've ever tasted in my life. And all the other players, which a lot of the ball players are experts at this stuff, all that the line was going out the door trying to get this tequila. And so then I spoke to the um, owner, um, uh, the people in charge, and got to the owner of the tequila company of Commissario and um, cut a deal with him to suddenly help me bring it to the next level. He was struggling a little bit how to get it to market, and uh, me and Steve had, had taken it on, and uh, uh, we've won every major uh, uh, contest out there on, uh, on tequilas, you know, comparing them against other at Blind Taste and all these big names of the Don Julio's and the, uh, the Patrons and stuff like that, I will stand up to our product to any of them. And I would, I would, I'm always a winner. That's what I, you play with pro sports, and I know I'll be a winner with this product too because it's just fabulous. We've got a great prod package and a, a great product with inside. You're listening to Business Pulse Talk Radio. I'm your host, Michael Brett. I have my very special guest with me today, Rick Darnell, uh, ex-professional uh, basketball player and businessman now with Elite Beverage International and their flagship product, uh, Tequila Commissario. Um, and 
you're also will transition. Uh, this show, I guess, is always about getting high on something, either uh, alcohol <laughs> or, or or weed or yeah. cannabis or whatever. But uh, I've just got to transition into this, and we'll get back to the tequila in a minute. But you are uh, very instrumental in the cannabis business as far as licensing or obtaining licenses. You're working with the uh, uh, with the retired association to get medical cannabis uh, into the allowing players to use it without being mm-hmm. reprimanded or fired or, mm-hmm. or whatever. So let's talk about that. First off, how did you get into the cannabis business? Uh, it was about five years ago. I might have been special ed in when I was in college. And uh, five years ago, somebody... Uh, he said to me, you gotta got look at this 20, 20 or 60 minute uh, of thing that they're having on TV. It's about CBD and kids and stuff like that. And I go, oh, okay, whatever, I'll, okay, I'll look at it. And so I looked at this and I was looking at this little girl, twin girls had, one of them was having no seizures and the other girl was having 300 seizures around that uh, a day. And um, I was kind of amazed, and I go, I go, where's this going? I'm, I'm really, you know, caring about this, feeling for this girl, and that her father was fighting for the doctors to subscribe her uh, marijuana, and it was really CBD, and it, it's a form of of that uh, cannabis products. There's marijuana, there's cannabis, there's cannabis is the medical part, and so I watched this uh documentary and next thing you know is this girl starts taking the cbd it's called charlotte's web a form of that cbd and uh she went down to one seizure a day from, three, go, from 300 to oh wow okay and Excellent. i'm i'm like in shock and i'm going <clears throat> wow uh there must be something good in this product and i start looking into it I, I know there's a really bad problem with the NBA with with opiate addiction, which is ridiculous. I, I argue with the NBA and um, local governments and stuff like that for a long time because, you know, when the guys retire, I, they're handed off to me here in L.A. and a lot of them are addicted to opiates, and nobody cares about that. And they're they're wondering why. Uh, I was just talking to in a golf tournament with uh, Christian and Coy and uh, Ron Brown and a couple other uh, NFL guys, and Brian Leaf is like a a superstar in their eyes because uh, nobody realized the trouble that Brian had when he was the quarterback of the Chargers like that that they, he was so addicted to opiates that he was losing not all uh, concussions and the opiate problem that uh, he got a little lost and he was out of control. Mm -hmm. And it was all caused by the pro sports because they just need to have you feeling good to go out there and play on the field because you're a piece of meat. And um, they uh, didn't really care for the guys. And so I started working with the... uh, Dr. P. Amelli over here at UC Irvine, some great doctors I've gotten involved with, and we're actually now trying to create a CBD product that will actually uh, help with pain management. Um, we're, we, we're doing pain management ca- uh, kits, it's Vivera is the name of the company, I'm trying to help pulling them out, wonderful people, but they're getting kits that actually are going into rehab uh, situations, SOBA, uh, as a big rehab center, and they partnered up, and now they're doing case studies. They got AJ McLean that, from the Backstreet Boys and different things like that, Miss America, and they're actually coming out with this great uh, product that's actually dosage, it's sublingual product. Uh, you take this uh, tab melt, and it's two minutes. It's in your system. It's not a, you're not no side effects, no nothing, but it, and they have a cream there for the pain uh, to help stop the pain and they're having unbelievable success and you don't need all the pharmaceutical opiate stuff that really causes all the problems yeah yeah and so i've gotten really heavily involved with that and getting licensing working with the the people in charge of california and some other people of uh, we go out and get the applications to make sure people do it uh, properly correctly and get their license for them. So the licensing would be if somebody wants to open up a dispensary? Is that yeah, a dispensary, whatever the city is. Uh, we have a, uh, a group of people. My One of my partners writes those applications for a company called Green Rush and himself, uh, Cushman Greenfield. And we just go in and write the applications. And 
uh, it's very uh, competitive, so you have to write the application so they do a points and they grade it on points. So you make sure that you've you've checked every. Uh, box and make sure the the applications are filled out correctly. So it's really, it's not something that somebody can do themselves. Uh, starting out trying to get the dispensary, they really need to deal with a professional organization, somebody that knows how to fill out the paperwork. Yeah, it's and, and there's, a lot of people do try it and majority of them do fail because the experts, there's, there's little things in there that you, Little caveats is do you have so many members from the community involved in your company? Uh, it goes into the race. How many other do you have any other minorities involved? Each one of those little things add points to your system. How you get those applications done? Now, do you do uh, do you work out of out of California in different states, different countries? Yeah, we've. Um, it's actually my partner Sam. He's all across the country. I think he was just last week. It was in Missouri. Now they're going to Illinois. We're going to Arkansas. We've we've got applications in Maryland, De uh, uh, Philadelphia, um, Ohio, Florida, Nevada, California, Oregon, uh, on and on. And then when we first started this, we were trying to think out outside the box, which I'm really good at times. And uh, we went after and got a license in Uruguay. We just got our second license in Denmark. And then we're going to... Um, uh, Germany, we're almost finished with Germany, and then we're putting out two licenses in Greece. Out, uh, aside from just helping companies get the licensing, do you uh, step in and help them run the business, the dispensary? Do you have a team to do that, or? Yeah, we we we, come, we, uh, um, we do all the compliance to make sure they stay legal, and we always stay on board and take a piece of the company because the laws are ever changing. You know, you you can be completely correct tomorrow on your on your company, and the following day they change the law, and if you continue not make those corrections, you'll lose your license. So we stay on board to help that. And um, you help them with. Uh, I know in I had some exposure to it. I've taken a couple of companies public in the cannabis space in Canada, and I've gotten them a dual listing down here. So I understand that a lot of them are having banking issues also. So do you help them along with that? We've got about five minutes. And uh, uh, yeah, we do. Yeah, we we we're trying to find the secret. I don't think anybody really has that secret yet. But we work with Diane Goldstein with Leap, Law Enforce, Enforcement Against Prohibition. She's been sitting on panels trying to get the government uh, convinced to uh, change this law, and hopefully that's coming real soon. Excellent. I want to mention why we're on the uh, topic of cannabis. Uh, before we started this show, I got uh, an email from uh, an, a business associate of mine that uh, has a fund that uh, finances cannabis companies also. And uh, if you're an established cannabis company with revenue, um, anywhere from 2 to $5 million. So if anybody listen to this show, if you want information on that investment capital, send me an email at Mike Brett at gmail.com, mikebrett at gmail.com, and I'll get you some information. Mm -hmm. And Mike Brett is B-R-E-T-T-E -T -T -E at gmail.com, and I'll get you that information. And Rick, give us your contact information for people, phone number, email, whatever's okay, best. Okay, uh, my uh, phone number is 714-493-4513. Also, too, you get me at rick.darnell0610 at gmail.com. And I want to throw one other thing in with our uh, tequila company right now. We have uh, guys like Michael Cage, who's the announcer for Oklahoma Thunder, is involved with us. AC Green is involved with us. I'm doing some other things with him, too. Um, um, Keith Erickson, uh, Norm Nixon's involved with us. Uh, Kiki Vanderway. I've got a lot of professional, top calling professional athletes who believe. Uh, and I'm not paying these guys. They believe in our tequila company, Commissario. Are, are they helping with uh, the branding, the marketing? Help, what are, what's what's their role in this? Branding, marketing, uh, networking to other distributors and stuff like that. Um, doing uh, bottle signings. We're going to be doing as soon as bottling, bottling sign, signing at high times. I think there'll be one a month for the next three months coming up right now. Uh, we've brought in on Keith, uh, uh, Chris Young, uh, country western singer. I think he's going to be Costco in uh, no. I think it's August. I'm 12th. I'm not sure of the exact date yet. Uh, he's doing another one in Colorado. But we're bringing some really big uh, artists, uh, celebrities that are very highly. Uh, Respected and love our product. And give us your contact information one more time, in case people tuned in the last. Uh, the telephone number, email address. Uh, 
Okay, so that's 714-493-4513. And then you can also meet me at rick at elitebeverage.com or rick.darnell0610 at gmail. Excellent. You've been listening to Business Pulse Talk Radio. I'm your host, Michael Brett. We bring you this show every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time here on OC Talk Radio. And again, the show is all about business all the time. We're here to introduce you to entrepreneurs like Rick Darnell uh, that help you know, professional athletes transition from sports into business, just like Rick did. We're here to uh, introduce you to starting your own business. If you have a business, we'll help you grow the business. If you're trying to find investment capital, we'll show you how to do it legally, structurally offering the SEC and the state's uh, regulatory boards uh, want. We're going to talk about valuations on some other shows. Why are valuations important? to investors. Why you, Why should you care? So we're going to cover a lot of news that you can use, again, to start a business and grow a business. Again, Business Pulse Talk Radio. I'm your host, Michael Brett. Every Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific Time, here on OC Talk Radio. Thank you.